All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in for this session on machine learning. My name is Aldo Solari. I'm uh, from the University of Milano Bicocca, and uh, I will uh, chair this session with the assistance of uh, Filippo Chiarello and Lorenzo Salvi. Before we begin, I would like to congratulate the organizers for not giving up on this conference and doing such an excellent job of moving the conference from Milan to here, wherever it is. And in this session, we will go over a machine learning application. I'm very excited to have uh, uh, four young speakers that will present their work. Each presentation uh, is uh, 15 minutes long, and uh, at the end of all presentation, all the speakers Will be called back on stage for the Q&A round. So I remind the audience uh, that you, if you have any questions, please write your question in the session chat. Please interact with the speakers. So um, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Daniel Meister, CTO at Data House in Zurich. Uh, the title of Daniel's talk is uh, The Duplicating Real Estate Ads by Using Naive Based Record Linkage. Hey, Daniel. Hello. Do you hear me well? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Are you well? Could you please uh, share your slides? Sure. I remind to uh, switch off your camera after that. Sure. <laughs> so you're good to go. Okay, thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be able to kick off this uh, session about uh, machine learning at the ERM 2020 with a presentation about our project doing record linkage on real estate ads. So this is a real project from the industry. And actually, I want to never start a talk with an apology, but still I have to tell you that while there is a lot of artificial intelligence in the project, there is not yet that much machine learning. And uh, the reason I'm in this session is more of a scheduling constraint we had uh, because of moving the conference to, to a later date. So thank you to the organizers for being able to uh, to do this. And of course, also I want to to join Aldo in thanking all the people working tirelessly behind the scenes uh, who made this virtual conference uh, possible. So before I start to talk about how we use the, the different tools available in, in our in industry to do uh, different projects, as we are not a famous university or huge company, let me just uh, spend 30 seconds to tell you who is Data House. Uh, we started doing data science using R back in 2005. Actually, we uh, switched to R version 2 for the first commercial project. And it has been really great to see how the community has grown over those uh, last 15 years and also to see the emergence of, of R being used in, in industry more and more over the, the recent years. We joined the, the VS Partner Group in 2014. VS Partner is the, the largest real estate consulting company in Switzerland and also expanding into Europe. And I guess this then also explains a little bit why I will be talking about real estate ads uh, today. So let me quickly go through the agenda for today's talk. I will give you a short a pedagogical introduction into record linkage. So what's the problem we are trying to solve? I will talk a bit about our raw data. So what's really the problem with real estate ads? And then I will go through the various uh, steps we use to, to solve this problem. And of course, at the end, I will try to, uh, to give some learnings we, we had while while working on, on this project. So starting with a very quick introduction into record linkage, uh, I mean, in the principle, it's the problem of handling duplicated records. And you might ask yourself, well, is this really important? And I have to tell you from a practical perspective, yes, it is very much, and, and it will become more 
and more so uh, because as most of you may realize the the number of measurements we do is growing exponentially faster than the number of interesting data points there is and so this of course means that we we do measure some some, some things twice or three times and to do proper data analysis it's very often required to merge uh, those records back together so for possible problems you could uh, introduce bias into your analysis maybe you want to do data enrichment uh, applications where you need to combine different data sets relating to the same entity and of course sometimes also the count of distinct cases in, is in itself relevant for uh, for a statistical data analysis uh, of course you all know the simple solution there is uh, the very nice distinct function in in deep uh, the problem with that is it scales with with n squared so for a large number of records you need really need to think a bit about uh, about more advanced solutions and of course in in real life record linkage you will hardly ever have records that that match exactly but you will need some uh, some fuzzy logic when you want to match the the different records so for univariate problems this is this is very easy right you can define your distance metric for numerical values you can take an absolute the relative difference uh, for categories you can do identical or non-identical matching or some step difference functions and even for strings and uh, text data it's uh, it's fairly easy to do there are the levenstein distances uh, and all the the derived metrics from there where you can easily also compare to uh, to very large texts the problem gets a little bit more interesting once you go to to some multivariate distance metrics because well i guess it's very obvious that just uh, the simple euclidean distance is not gonna gonna cut it right if you look for example at an apartment where you want to compare real estate ads for two uh, apartments uh, it's a huge difference whether you have one room more in the one apartment or whether you have just one square meter of living space more so just using an unweighted distance is, is not uh, uh, gonna cut it so we decided here to use a naive base combination of of some probabilities uh, because there you have the very nice feature that you only need the function that maps the similarities to probabilities uh, so you need for example a conditional probability to observe uh, let's say square meters in real estate ads that are only one percent apart and then uh, what's the probability to observe this similarity given that the two records are really describing the same object and then of course you also need the complementary probability to use base formula which you can see on the bottom right hand part of the slide to then combine these probabilities into into a final matching probability that describes how how similar the two different records are or what's the probability that they really are describing the the same objects so as I already started uh, taking examples from the real estate world, let me uh, move on to talk a little bit about the problem with raw data. So the problem with, with real estate ads. And even though uh, we are only looking at ads from Switzerland and uh, Germany at the moment for the last uh, seven to, to eight years, uh, this amounts up to around 60 million records we're trying to compare so i guess you will uh, realize by now that the n squared so comparing every record with every other is clearly a non-starter uh, solving this problem and we're looking at ads for rental flats as well as condominiums and uh, of course there are numerous online publication platforms where you can uh, where you can search such ads and also maybe i have to to add here it's not uh, a problem 
arriving from the fact that we would scrape this data somehow even if you if you buy the data and really have good data sources available just the problem of combining from all those uh, uh, different sources gives you those uh, 60 million ads that uh, of course uh, cannot all describe different flats because there are simply aren't that many flats in in switzerland and germany and also this is data where you have some inherent time series structure so a uh, flat is, us is usually rented more than uh, once during seven years. So you have one tenant moving in and then maybe moving out two years later. So in addition to duplicating the ads over the different uh, platforms, you also have the problem that you might see the ad a few years later again, but then maybe with a, a price that is a little bit higher or a little bit lower. I mean, usually it's higher and not lower, obviously, but... Uh, it's a, it's a complex problem then to decide also for an expert which ads to really belong to to the same object. Also, if you have ever looked at such ads yourself, you, you may realize that there is a lot of, of really unstructured information. So mostly you have the price available as a number and maybe you have the number of uh, square meters living area available as a number uh, but this is not just a simple number-based record linkage problem so you have to do feature extractions on the on the unstructured uh, parts for example it can be the case that you have the the street address in the title of the ad you have some description of the flat in the text you have uh, different formats and uh, especially for switzerland you have a huge problem also with multiple languages where especially in the region where both german and french is being spoken you very often see ads for the same flats available in in two different uh, languages and so, of course, we are also looking here at the, the recent advances into this whole natural language processing using deep uh, learning. And of course, there also are the, the pictures usually connected to the ad. So uh, this would be then another idea also to, to compare the two different pictures using some, some deep learning network uh, structure. So then how do we deal with this? So how do we get around the the n squared problem with comparing every record uh, to each other? Well, for uh, real estate data, this might seem kind of obvious because there is some some really nice regional structure in, in real estate data that can be used uh, to, to do a multi-layered approach because very often the, the flats that are being advertised or placed in the correct location and you might wonder whether this will ever be the case that it's put in the wrong location and yes it is especially around the large cities uh, it's quite common that the ad kind of suggests that uh, the flat might be in the city and then if you if you look very closely and compare addresses and so on you will find out that it's actually outside the city but they want people searching for flats within the city also to find to find their offer uh, but still this helps us a little bit that we can start filtering and comparing ads within different municipalities and then once we filtered out the identical parts there and linked uh, the ones that describe the same object we can move one one layer higher and compare within the the canton in Switzerland that is the next uh, uh, political structure you have and then in the very end you can also compare within the within the entire country and see whether you find any ads that have been uh, intentionally or unintentionally placed in in the wrong location some results or how well does this approach work on the plot on the left hand side you can see the the ad counts here for switzerland only not for the combined data set in millions and 
on the x-axis you can see the time it took to to do the three different processing steps so you see the first step just filtering identical ads within the same municipality this is uh, uh, this is very very fast uh, because you can use some some classical divide and conquer algorithms there and parallelize it and then the, the second step comparing the ads with the naive base this obviously takes much longer especially because you have to do all this uh, uh, this feature extraction and uh, text comparison uh, functions in the end, on the right-hand side, you can see that one gets a very good separation in the second and the third step between uh, ads that we are very sure should not be linked together that describe a different objects on the left-hand side and ads that describe the, the same object that have a very high linkage uh, probability on the right-hand side. And then, of course, this is also something we, we checked with... Uh, with experts uh, in this example here using a shiny app where they could look at two ads that are somewhere around the threshold and could rate whether this uh, these two ads describe the same object or not so how exactly did we use r here or what didn't did we and didn't we we do in r uh, of course i mean this is not something very new but large amount of data is sometimes better handled in, in databases because if you take all the 60 million ads obviously this cannot be put into the RAM you need a lot of uh, filtering and sorting uh, steps at which databases are just uh, a little bit better and uh, of course we also plan to to look into the disk punct frame disk dot frame package in the in the near future also um, for parallel processing you need to be very careful about what this is already uh, done in parallel for the linear algebra operations and of course in the end you also need to move the process to production somewhere somehow and there we heavily uh, rely on docker to provide portability and scalability because you can very nicely just uh, port the entire project from your development environment to a a production server so uh, coming to an end i would like to share a few learnings out of this uh, project from from an industry perspective so uh, about R, R as a data pipeline uh, combining it with databases and uh, docker this gives a really nice and very well usable setup the naive base uh, combination is very flexible and transparent, um, but of course the domain knowledge is, is critical here for the analysis uh, design. Also, if you want to transfer the method to some other uh, to some other data sets, and then also of course uh, in private industry, it's very often usability before perfection. Business cares about usable solutions. The perfect solution is always too expensive, and also, if others can't use your code, it will disappear over time. And this is also a really nice feature of this uh, Docker setup. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I would be very interested also then maybe in the discussion session to talk a little bit on where we could improve this uh, with more machine learning and less expert uh, learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your great talk. And um, I remind the audience to double click on the slides to maximize them and maybe hide the chat. Uh, and uh, I invited the, the audience to, to, to write uh, questions on the, on the chat for the speakers. So let's move on to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker, Emanuele Cordano. Emanuele is an environmental engineer at Rendena 100 in Trento. Um, uh, good morning, yes. Um, hi, I'm, uh, hi, hi. I'm uh, okay. Um, I, sh I share the screen. Yeah, please share your, your slides. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can you hear me. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. 
And uh, I need to go here. So I remind you to turn off your camera and uh, you are good to go. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Manuela, I can't hear you. Is your mic on? Okay, oh, okay. okay. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh... Can you see my uh, sorry? Okay. You need to sh to share your slides. Yeah. Okay. Go here and here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Turn off your camera, okay. please. Okay. Turn off my camera. Okay. Ah, okay, this one, sorry. Uh... Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you are good okay. to go. Uh, okay, sorry for my, I, uh, if I interrupt the, okay. And uh, my talk is an ideological model in R, and I'm talking about the package that I developed, uh, which is called JetaBricks, and uh, with other, other colleagues. And it, it, it's an, an, an interface to an uh, ideological model. Uh, my model, the ideology, is the scientific study of the movement, the distribution, the quality of water, including the water site in uh, in in the in the in, in, in terrain and we study a lot of physical phenomena like precipitation, evaporation, gra gra groundwater, and uh, and the river and the river discharge. In, in this particular ideological model are mathematical instrument deterministic that estimated the soil water content in, uh, and um, uh, evapotranspiration, also snow, in, in fact, weather forcing, precipitation, e evaporation, temperature. And they are the integrator of a partial differential equation, which are the partial of, of the, uh, differential equation of soil uh, water mass and uh, the soil uh, heat uh, energy balance equation, which, derive, which are phys physically based. And in particular, we are, all, okay, I, we are talking about this model, which is uh, written in C++ and it's open source. And uh, it's, um, and, um, Generally, I'm an environment in hydrology. I'm an envir in an environmental application. We apply the we can apply this model uh, and study a point uh, of our area, which is a precipitation. Uh, 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 so we can study the the movement in 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 a cell column when you have a lot of, of information and a lot of of of, of data of this site, or otherwise. Uh, in a more classical way, uh, you can extend, extend the model as uh, as uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in a bigger region uh, like a watershed, and uh, uh, you can solve the, the equation in in three dimensional equation in in three dimensional way: latitude, longitude, and and, and the soil depth. Uh, I would like. Uh, uh, I would like to enter um, directly in the in the R package because uh, the JTOP is, is is open source and written in C++. But uh, uh, the this model is is quite um, complicated in the, in, in terms of um, the input and output, and um, this model are put in 
in, in a further, but there is, it is important there is a, a, config, a, a configuration files which contains keywords addressing two um, simulation option parameters, but also to input data, so, so, so input files, meteorological forcing, soil information, and geomorphological, uh, and geomorphological information of the area, and output files. In this case, uh, sp spatial temporal maps of, uh, um, of the results, which are result, uh, which may have, uh, which can be soil water content, uh, uh, snow depth, uh, uh, evaporation, or re river discharge. This, uh, this uh, files as a syntax with the keyword with the value, which is uh, and and uh, JotaBricks parses these files and import in, uh, in uh, the data of of JotaP directly into the R section. Um, let's talk to uh, uh, here. Um, so the package is an, an an interface to use this uh, kind of model. Uh, we have a, a one dimension a, a one dimensional case, which uh, is uh, located in uh, uh, which is a, a, an environmental research study uh, laboratory in the, in the, in the Alps in South Tyrol, close to Austria and Switzerland. The Macheta, and his, so you have one point in the, in the, in, in this hislop, which is called B2, uh, is located in Valmazia, and, and then there is another point which is P2. Uh, in this case, uh, okay, I, I, I don't want to uh, go into the taste of hydrology and ecology. We can, uh, um, with the simple, uh, with the simple R package, which is called, uh, which is the, the, the top bricks, uh, you can call. The, the directory of uh, in our machine of um, uh, containing the, the, the data of the simulation B2 uh, and uh, with uh, a simple function of, um, of, uh, of this, of this uh, package uh, you can uh, um, retrieve the, uh, the ZOO object which is the, in this case the, the meteorological uh, sources time series and uh, just calling a keyword which is called uh, this is a plot that uh, after the data is, is important in our session, we can, um, we can plot. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, similar things uh, you can do for soil water content, uh, which is another keyword. Is, um, um, uh, which, uh, here is, there is the other uh, uh, option that are well documented in, in the help function of uh, the this of uh, this uh, uh, in help documentation of, of this function, and uh, and uh, we can have the soil water the soil moisture uh, uh, the, the soil water content data, the same uh, which is the in this case uh, the the uh, the expected output uh, of our study. The same uh, we can uh, we can do for the near for the near, for the near point which is called P2. Uh, here uh, the working path in P2 and and the S the WC P2. Uh, here the, here the, the soil water content uh, related to this simulation and uh, uh, you can have a, 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 you can briefly have a, a plot of. Uh, of uh, of the soil water content patterns during time uh, versus time for the, the case P2 and P2 and uh, simulated at different depth of soil between uh, from three centimeters to uh, half a meter more or less. Uh, here is uh, I um, uh, here are uh, three dimensional. Uh, here is a case of the, of a three dimensional uh, spatial distribution, which is located. Okay, the the procedure is the same. Uh, the the area is uh, is a is a fish now close to Switzerland in South Tyrol. The here here the, here there is the uh, path to the. To, to the folder containing simulation, and here you can extract, for instance, the land cover map of our basin, which is imported, which is directly imported as a, a raster layer class of the raster package. Here is a plot uh, made directly with R of, of, of this area. Uh, the P2 and B2 are uh, point located here. Uh, in the red point are the weather station because uh, uh, the model uh, um, 
because the water processing is, is, is generally uh, measured by, uh, uh, measured on the on the on the, the terrain in in uh, in single point in, in several point in uh, uh, about the area and here um, with the with the with a similar similar function just calling the the proper keyword uh, you can have the soil water content uh, simulated by our model by the by Jotop model at a different depth of uh, uh, um, uh, for all uh, uh, for the entire area uh, we can have the uh, uh, first layer and then the uh, the most deepest the the uh, most uh, the deepest layer uh, the, finally uh, with the uh, extracting by the by the jotop uh, by the by the jotop uh, uh, a simulation uh, you can also have a a, a, a plot the, 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 the time series and, and then you can create a plot of the uh, um, of the water discharge at the outlet in function of the mean of the average precipitation in uh, fallen in, uh, in in the whole the area and, then, and so on, also, also evaporation and transpiration, which are the main component of the ideological cycle. Uh, in the end, uh, just uh, to, uh, I would like to show you, but I don't insert the code now, uh, an application that, that I did for my job, uh, it's related as uh, snow cover modeling, because uh, um, this model, which is, uh, apply, which is, uh, Often applied in in uh, in uh, alpine um, environment, alpine area, has a, a, a deterministic, uh, as a good deterministic uh, model for snow, uh, is, is, is snow depth uh, modeling. In this case, uh, there are some colleagues uh, study which are um, ecology, which which are uh, who are uh, animal ecologists, and they are in, in interested to roe deer and uh, wildlife in, in this area. Which is located in Trentino, between uh, in, uh, in located in Varendena. Here is Antione di Trento, where I from where I'm speaking, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I simulated the a, a snow depth map, uh, taking the taking the the, the, the data of the um, weather station uh, sign in uh, uh, yellow. Um, these are uh, 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 a snapshot of this study, which are um, which which I, which I, okay. I'm um, thank you. Okay, uh, which are the mean depth and and, and there's no duration aggregated uh, through um, after retrieving the data through R uh, for this winter, and uh, uh, here the here is a. a, 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 a Further uh, summarize uh, is no depth and uh, as, as no cover in function of elevation, uh, in function of to the case and possible climate and and, and, and future climate change projection. Um, the, the physical uh, result uh, you can see that the is, is no depth increasing its variability at the mean at, at this at elevation of 1000 meters, 100,000. One thousand uh, uh, five hundred meters uh, in in uh, in uh, in the future, due due to climate change. Uh, then um, I I finish my presentation. It's an interface of this model. Jotops in in R speak in the language of Jotop. Through Jotop Bricks, user can interact between R and Jotop using our environment and and the Jotop keyboard system without uh, getting crazy to search files throughout specific. Um, uh, Jotop folder and uh, this uh, finally this presentation has been created as a mar as a markdown living uh, living and a re reproducible document. This means that all shown uh, results from J J J Jotop are um, can be uh, automatically imported and plotted for uh, uh, reproducible research and uh, dynamic uh, report. I, I thank you the, the organization and um, the, all the Jotop community and also the R contributor.
here is an, a, an presentation um, about us uh, and, um, a and a research colleague of mine, Dr. Giacomo Bertardi, with, I, uh, with which I worked for uh, the Jotop project. I, um, I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, thank you. I finished my, my thank presentation. Thank you, Manuele, thank you. for a great talk. And uh, let's move on to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce the third speaker of this session, uh, Stefano Ranzetti. Stefano is a PhD student at the University of Milano. Stefano? Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Hi, Stefano. How are you? Hi, everyone. Okay, um, please share your slides yeah. and uh, remind to turn off your camera afterwards. You are good to go. Okay. Uh, can you see the slides? Um, can you see them? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Aldo, for the introduction. And hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today to, to talk to you about the GWQS package. Uh, so uh, please, GWQS... Uh, sorry, Stefano, please yeah. uh, uh, turn off your camera. Ah, yeah, sorry, forgot about it. Okay, sorry. So uh, GWQS is a package that was uh, initially developed in 2016 uh, to allow uh, user to apply, to apply this novel statistical method of uh, the quantile sun, weighted quantile sun regression. Uh, in these last years, uh, the package uh, had major updates, and in this talk I'm going to talk you about the last version, uh, which is going to be available uh, very soon in, in a few days on Crime. Uh, so what is WQS? Uh, WQS is a new statistical method that was uh, developed to face the problem of environmental mixture exposure. And nowadays, uh, it is known that humans carry a body burden of multiple classes of contaminants, uh, which can have a synergistic effect on a health outcome, even at low levels. Uh, moreover, uh, we have an increasing amount of information that we can collect uh, at, low, at lower cost. Uh, classical statistical methods uh, may not be appropriate because of high dimensional data, uh, correlated variables, and low exposure level, often below detection limit. Um, while shrinkage methods may be uh, particularly useful when we have a high number of predictors um, and also uh, correlated predictors, but they have a limitation in a risk evaluation of environmental chemical mixture. So WKS regression uh, constructs a weighted index, uh, which is represented uh, by the sum in the formula, uh, which estimates the mixture effect of uh, mixture components on an outcome. The elements in the mixture are usually ranked in quantiles to have a standardized measure and to have a more robust estimates against outlier and extreme values. And the mixture effect associated with, uh, with the additive combination of the mixture components is assessed through a standard regression test on the weighted index, while the estimation of uh, weights uh, associated with uh, each individual predictor allows for the assessment of the discrete effects of each individual predictor on the dependent variable. To estimate the model, the data set may be split in a training and validation data set. Uh, the first one uh, to be used for the weight estimation uh, and the second one to test uh, uh, the significance um, of the final WQS index. Uh, in order to estimate the weights, uh, a bootstrap method uh, is applied, as we can see also from this figure. And uh, uh, in the training step, uh, uh, the log likelihood equation is optimized uh, in each bootstrap step uh, to obtain the set of weights that maximize the equation. Uh, weights are constrained to sum to one and uh, are also bounded between zero and one. 
uh, and the bootstrap data sets uh, are generated sampling from the training set um, which is uh, with a uh, with replacement as we can see from uh, the figure here in the um, in the validation step the WKS index is estimated as a linear combination of the weights and the quantile variables, as we can see from the, this formula. And uh, when averaging the bootstrap weights, um, a signal function uh, is used to select uh, the, the set of weights associated to a positive or a negative beta parameter, depending on the chosen direction to investigate. Because since we have only a single index, we can investigate one direction at a time. Uh, once the WKS index is found, uh, a standard generalized linear model is uh, fitted using the uh, WKS index as a variable in the model. Uh, the R package, uh, GWKS, extends um, the regression method to application with continuous categorical and count outcomes. Uh, in particular, uh, this package uses the opt-in function from the stats package as an optimization algorithm, algorithm to estimate the weights. And we created uh, the WQS data dataset, uh, which is available once the package is installed and loaded. Uh, to demo uh, this package, um, so we can use this package to demonstrate the the use of these functions. Um, this data reflects 59 exposure uh, concentrations simulated from a distribution of 34 PCB exposure and 25 talent biomarkers, uh, which were measured in a subject participating in the NN study 2001-2002. And uh, additionally, eight outcome measures uh, were simulated uh, applying different distribution fixed beta coefficient to the predictors. Uh, here we have a sample code that allows to feed the WKS regressor for continuous outcome. Uh, in this first line of code, uh, we saw that we, we saved the mixture element names in the variable PCBs. Uh, and then um, we feed the model using the function GWKS. Uh, in the GWKS formula, the WKS term must be included as if a WKS variable was present in the data set. Um, then um, the, the mixture variables uh, were ranked in the size, as we can see from the option Q equal 10. Um, and the data were divided in 40% uh, for training and 60% for validation, specified by the validation equal to 0 0.6. Uh, 100 bootstrap samples were assigned for parameter estimation through the parameter B equal 100. Uh, and because uh, WQS provides a unidirectional evaluation of mixture effects, uh, we first examine the weights derived from booster models um, where beta 1 was positive. In fact, we set beta 1 underscore pos equal to true. Uh, we can also uh, choose to constrain uh, the, the beta 1 to be positive in this case. Uh, however, in this example, we did not constrain the beta 1 to be positive and we set beta 1 const equal to false and then we chose a, a gaussian family and and we fixed a, a seed uh, for um, uh, reproducible results um, through the common summary results we can get a standard output that we usually have uh, uh, using a glm model uh, from the output we can see that uh, there is a positive significant association between the WQS index and the outcome. Uh, and other methods uh, like predict uh, residual COF can be applied to the GWQS output. Uh, there are also other um, secondary functions that allow to create predefined plots and tables. Uh, here is a list of the main functions. Um, for example, uh, for the linear outcome, uh, we can 
plot a bar plot of the weights and the scatter plot of it or a diagnostic plot of the residuals and fitted values. And um, here is a, uh, a, an example of the plots that we can generate with these functions. Uh, the, the bar plot shows the weight uh, values ranked from the highest to the lowest and put uh, a pre-specified cutoff uh, represented by the red dashed line equal to the inverse of the number of elements in the mixture. Uh, from the scatter plot, we can see uh, a linear positive trend of the association between the WKS index and the outcome. Uh, while from the diagnostic plot, we can check that there is no pattern between the fitted values and the residuals. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce two new extensions of WQS that are implemented in the GWQS package. Uh, the first one is the random, sub, is the random subset implementation, um, which provides a random selection of a subset of the variables included in the mixtures, as shown by the figure. Uh, so instead of um, sampling from ro by rows, we sample from uh, by column. And so this, uh, this approach allows to have more decorrelated subsets of variables. Uh, it reduces parameter estimates variance and is uh, also more effective uh, when the numbers of predictors exceeds the number of uh, subjects compared to the standard WQS. Here is um, a code uh, example. So uh, we still can save the names of the variables uh, that we want to include in the mixture. Um, <clears throat> and we can still use the WQS function. Uh, and we need to specify the option RS equal to true, uh, the number of variables to be included in each uh, subsamples through the n vars equal to eight. Uh, so here we are included eight, eight variables and we can increase the number of iterations to be sure that every variable is included in uh, enough times. Um, uh, the default value for uh, n bars is the square root of the number of elements in the mixtures. And usually uh, we suggest to set b equal to 1000 in this case. Uh, a second extension is the uh, repeated old out WQS and is uh, still available. Uh, is, you can implement it uh, still with, uh, through the GWQS package. And this method uh, involves the repeated split of the data set in multiple test and validation data sets. Um, and on each data partition, a WQS model is fitted. Um, in this way, we obtain an approximately normal distribution of the weights and the regression parameters uh, from which we can obtain the final parameter estimates and the confidence intervals. Uh, the advantages uh, of these methods are the more stable and representative uh, parameter and weight estimates um, and the ability to characterize the weight distribution. Uh, while um, an imitation of this approach is that is more computational intensive. Uh, here is a, still an example of the code. So the only difference are the, uh, we need to, to use a different function, the GWQSRH function. Uh, the call is more or less the same as before. And we need to specify also the number of uh, repeated uh, validation samples through the command rh equal to 100. Okay, so the, just to summarize, so one uh, last plot that we can create with this uh, final method is uh, the box plot of uh, each element that show the distribution of uh, each component of the mixture. And to summarize, we can say that WQS is a robust approach against outlier extreme values and correlated data. Uh, it is able to deal with high dimensional data and we saw how the uh, GWQS package allows to implement this novel statistical method and its extension like the random subset and the repeated all doubt implementation, as well as the ability to apply the model to different type of outcomes. 
the package allows to combine all these features and it is uh, continuously updated and new features like the ability to estimate an interaction uh, between WKS index and the covariate and the implementation of a double uh, of a double index to investigate both directions will come out soon. So here I put just few references and I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my collaborators and mentors and thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Perfect timing. And um, okay. Okay, I think uh, now let's let's move on to the last speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Einstein Sorensen, associate professor at uh, Oslo, University of Oslo, and uh, the title of the talk is "Flexible Meta Analysis of Generalized Additive Models with with Metagam." Uh, okay, you are already sharing your slides uh, remember just to turn off the camera and you are good to go excellent can you hear me yes great perfect yeah so this talk is about meta-analysis so generalized additive models but also other nonlinear models and uh, the motivation for this work is that in many fields of science um, it's necessary to combine data from different studies in order to get sufficient statistical power to detect effects of interest. And I mean, typical examples of this is brain imaging and also genetics, uh, where you have lots of different variables and you just need a lot of data to find the necessary power. Um, however, there are some practical challenges to this. First of all, you have privacy, that uh, there are lots of concerns when it comes to sharing data between different research groups. Um, also, it might be more like legal that in the original data collection, maybe the participants weren't asked uh, whether they consented to the data being shared, for example, out of the country. And also it might be practical so that different labs use different data formats. And uh, one way of circumventing this problem is to let each group, I mean, I say group, and I mean like different labs that have different data, uh, if you let each of them fit their own model to the data so that they get their own estimates of the regression parameters, then these can be shared, the regression parameters, rather than sharing the data. Uh, and they can be found jointly by meta-analytic methods where you combine the regression parameters from each model uh, in some weighted way where the weights typically are uh, depending on the reliability of the different um, models. However, the problem with this, I mean, the, the, these methods for combining parameters are well known. However, what they typically require is that the models have been fitted with parametric uh, models. And also that the interpretation of each variable is the same across the different studies, so that the variables have to mean exactly the same thing. On the other hand, a lot, lot of problems require semi-parametric methods, where rather than estimating regression parameters, you, regret, uh, you estimate some nonlinear function, say f of x, but it might also be f of x1, x2, x3, I mean a high dimensional function, which is typically nonlinear. And the question is, how do we then combine estimates of this function from g different groups? So not because you know, we're assuming that we're not able to share the data. We just need the groups cooperate. Uh, they want to fit their models and we want to get, get the meta-analytic fit uh, in order to improve your statistical power. So for example, in a generalized additive model, you typically, or you have basis functions, so you construct a nonlinear function as a weighted combination of uh, splines, where the b's here are the splines. Uh, and the basis functions typically depend sensitively on the range of the explanatory variable x. So that if this explanatory variable has a different range in the different groups that did uh, or that collected data, you can't use the same splines in each of the data. The knot locations have to be different. And therefore, just combining the spline weights in a meta-analytic way is not really sufficient so you, because they're not comparable. So I'm going to motivate this with an example from brain imaging, 
where the question we asked was, how is sleep quality associated with lifespan development of hippocampus? So even those who are not neuroscientists know that the hippocampus is an important region in the brain, which is um, responsible for a lot of the executive control and what makes human really unique. And uh, in this project, we had six European partners. And each of these partners fitted one model that is like similar to what's written here, where we have one main function of age, which shows how hippocampus develops with age. And this is typically a very nonlinear pattern, as we will see. Uh, so a parametric model, like a linear model or model with, poly with polynomials, would typically not be sufficient for this. And then we also estimated the effect of sleep on the hippocampal development. So the question here is, do people who sleep more or le less or worse or better have a different lifespan development of the hippocampus? And one of the reasons why this is important is because the hippocampus, uh, the hippocampus is responsible for some of the problems that happen, say, in Alzheimer's disease. And you also see in these diseases that the sleep pattern is altered. So we're interested in understanding this relation. Now, in each of these groups, we, were, we had six European groups. All of them had longitudinal data on uh, both on the MRI, like MRI images, magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, estimating the volume of the hippocampus, and also on the sleep. And what we see here in the plot is the estimated lifespan uh, or age-related hippocampal volume in each of the groups. And one of the characteristics here is that some studies like CAMCAN, which is Cambridge University, and LCBC, which is Oslo, had estimates that were quite similar and also from the age of 20 until the age of around 90. Whereas Whitehall 2, for example, the one to the bottom right, which is Oxford University, they only had subjects above the age of 60. And also we see that they had a somewhat funny peak in the beginning of the, of the estimated function. Uh, so the idea here was to combine these six functional estimates um, and do the same also for the interaction effect, which shows how these curves are affected by how much you sleep. And what we did was uh, this, I mean, I have to say that this has also been done, like related methods have been invented before, for example, in, uh, in uh, ecological studies where you, where, for example, use the temperature in, in different locations. But for our purpose, we had to invent some new methods, which we call pointwise meta-analysis, where rather than sharing the data, each group that has their own data shares a function, an R function, which returns the predictions from the model. So yeah, rather than sharing um, regression coefficients, which we didn't have, we share a function that's able to produce new predictions, model fits, based on new the input data. So we need to share a predicting function. Uh, and in order to combine these predicting functions from each group, we uh, do a meta-analytic estimate by a weighted sum where we, at each point, at each point x where we want to estimate the effect, for example, at each h over a grid, we combine the function estimates. Uh, where the weights are based on the standard errors. And uh, there are lots of details here related to how to optimally combine these functions, how to weigh them, uh, how to compute the p-values, etc. And that's uh, detailed in the paper link below. But in order to do this in R, we would start with doing something like this. So we would agree upon a formula, a model that we would need to use. Uh, and in our case, it might look something like this. It's not exactly like this, but you would use the MGCV library because it has generalized additive models. And then you would fit some function y, which is a function of uh, the smooth function of one variable, a smooth function of variable two, and maybe a parametric function of variable three. And then each group would fit the model like this. And then in order to do the meta-analysis uh, that I showed on the previous slide, in principle, all you need to do is just send out this model object and call the predict function on it. And then we can just combine it using the mathematical tools that we developed. However, and this is really important, the model fits you get from R functions, for example, GAM, but also GLM and LM, are full of individual participant data. 
it might be the actual data frame that you use to, um, to fit the model. But there are also more like obscure or hidden uh, traces of individual participant data, like transformed value, values, where you've done the eigen decomposition, for example, stuff that can be transformed back into actual data. Or factor levels that might actually reveal individual participant data if, say, each individual has their own factor level. So we have to go carefully through this and understand how the model object saves all the data and how we could remove this. And that's why we invented this Metagon package. So in the Metagon package, you still start by fitting a model. And this is, as a, to repeat, this is done uh, at the location where the data sits. And then with the function that we call strip raw data from the Metagon package, you remove everything that's related to individual participant data. And all you keep is uh, the splines, the spline weights, and their covariance matrix. And currently, this works for several functions from the MDCV package. BAM, which is for very big data, GAM with two Ms, which is for mixed models, and similarly from the GAM4 package. So we have to carefully go through this for each of these model objects and see how the data were located, and then remove those objects to create new model objects. But the good thing is that when you run strip raw data on a fitted model, it's safe to share. There's no individual participant data in it anymore. So that uh, even if your participants didn't consent to you sharing the data with the collaborating group, now we can do it because it's only aggregated measures. Uh, and the next step is then to combine the models. And what you would do then is that you assume that, OK, the person doing the analysis gets models from three different sites, model one, model two, model three. Then the Metagam package has this, its main function, which we call Metagam, that takes these models. And you also, even though it does this automatically, you also probably should apply some common grid, uh, which is, for example, the ages over which you want to compute the combined estimate, um, or in general, just some grid. And then it computes the, um, the meta-analytic fit with standard errors, p-values, et cetera, anything you need. And in this brain imaging example that I mentioned, we were lucky enough that after a while, we actually got consent to analyze all the data in a single location. So we were able to share the data and perform a mega analysis, as we call it, where you do all the data in a single place. And then we were able to compare the Metagam approach, which does remote fitting and then combines the models, to the mega analysis, where you do all the fitting in the same place. And as we see here, for example, to the left, we see the lifespan hippocampus volume. The fits are quite similar. Um, and also the effect of sleep on the hippocampus volume. And this is kind of interesting. Uh, the effect of sleep is estimated to be zero. Like it's really, really close, uh, closely around zero. Uh, and uh, and the, again, the estimates are very similar between the meta-analytic fit that we did with the Metagon package and the mega-analysis fit. Um, now, the Metagon package also has lots of tools for post-fit analysis. We have a summary function, similar to what we saw in the previous presentation. Uh, and you also have a plot function that runs on the Metagon objects and shows how the individual functions have been combined in order to provide the meta-analytic estimate. Uh, but we also had some new developments. For example, we, um, we looked at how how, how much each model contributes across the range. So for the brain imaging example, uh, this is shown to the right here. So by calling plot the dominance, you can get an assessment along your grid of how much each model, no, or sorry, each model, like the model in fitted at each location contributes to the overall fit. And we also have something we call heterogeneity plots which is based on the Q value, which is often used in meta-analysis. But now we can also plot this one over a grid so that by calling the plot heterogeneity function, you can see how different the different functions, like the functions that you get from each of the data sets, how different they are. And if you're like in the frequentist world, you can also say that uh, when the confidence bands here are above zero, there is a significant difference in or they are significantly heterogeneous, to, to put it that way. 
Um, so to summarize, the Metagon package offers distributed fitting of generalized additive models. And it does that by removing raw data from the model objects. There is no new algorithm in there. It's just like carefully going through all the 50 elements of the lists returned by the MVCV package and delete all the stuff related to individual participant data. And then those models can be shared. And by using the Metagon function, you can combine those fits and get estimates very close to what you would obtain if you have access to the complete data. And we also have convenience functions for visualization and to obtain statistical summaries. Now, I was thinking about some other applications there, application areas of this. And since there are lots of people from the industry here, I was thinking that maybe in customer analytics, this could be relevant. Say if you have a business that has subsidiaries in different countries or different regulatory areas, for example, inside and outside of the European Union, where you want to make a model for your customers, but your customers have data that sits in different locations. So maybe this package could be useful also in this case. Also, um, I've used the strict raw data function when I'm fitting lots, like say thousands of models, uh, and you just want to reduce the memory load because each model object saves all the raw data, which usually is not necessary. Uh, it can also overcome data harmonization challenges. For example, when, when data can be combined, like you're allowed to do it, but uh, it's problems related to transformation of the scales, etc. And also, if the data is too large for memory, uh, one can imagine fitting separate models on subsets of the data and then use the Metagram package to, to combine the results. And this is also possible if you think about parallelization. Now, in the future, we plan to extend this to other classes of nonlinear models because the only requirement here is really that you should be able to predict something from the model. Of course, for, for parametric models like GLMs, there is no point in doing this because uh, you can already combine the parameters. But uh, say if one group fitted the cubic model and the other group fitted the quadratic model, then it might still be useful in GLMs. And we also think about more like flexibility in terms of Bayesian simulation from a posterior distribution and also some novel algorithms for computing p-values of the meta-analytic fits. So finally, I would like to thank all of you and uh, thanks to my co-developers, Andreas Brandmeier and Atanasia Movinke, and also thanks to the EU Commission who sponsored us through the LifeBrain project. So thank you. Thank you, Aisten, and uh, stay with us. Thank you for the great talk and uh, okay, we are all back together. I would like to thank again the speaker for the very nice talks that were presented in this uh, session on machine learning. And now it's time for Q&A. So we got uh, from the chat a couple of uh, questions. Start in order. Uh, now we have uh, 15 minutes for Q&A, so I start with uh, Daniel. There is one question from uh, Nina. Uh, this is a very short one. She is asking uh, if uh, there is a, a, a GitHub uh, with code for this, for what you presented. Um, not yet. So we, we plan to release the, the general methodology uh, code. And uh, of course, there is still some debate ongoing whether we can also release the, uh, the parametrization that were derived by experts or whether we need to stop at the methodology part. But uh, there are plans to do that. And of course, if uh, somebody is interested to collaborate or would like to reuse our work, feel free also to, to contact me directly. Very great. And there is a related question actually from Ekaterina asking uh, if you publish any article on this topic and if yes, where she can find that. Uh, so, I mean, no, it's not a scientific project it's more of an industry project so there is no journal article about it uh, there have been a few other presentations for example here at the, the local Zurich or user group meeting about the topic with uh, a few more uh, details and uh, the slides are now 
available via Twitter. So feel free also to contact me there for additional slides from previous talks. Okay, I have a very short question myself. Uh, how the linkage uh, threshold uh, is set for? I mean, in the end, uh, this is the interesting question, right? So at the moment, we, we really asked experts for their opinion on very close cases. And then we, we use that expert knowledge to kind of put the threshold in, a, in the point to get optimal uh, separation. But of course, with all the, the parameters you, you use for the probability functions, so to transfer from similarity to probability, it would be rather easy to put in some gradient descent algorithm or so that uh, based on the expert choices then optimizes this further. But as mentioned in the lessons, in the end, uh, the perfect solution is always too expensive in, in business. So the, the customer was very happy with the, the expert-based estimation of the threshold. Also, in the end, it depends a lot on how you want to use then the combined data set. If you really want to count different ads, you set another threshold than if you want to to make some sort of model for the prices where you're not um, so worried about having one ad twice. Okay. Uh... Actually, uh, I see in the chat uh... Uh, a remark from S Simon for uh, uh, reference to record linkage. Anyway, uh, I move on to Emanuele. Thank you, okay. Daniel. Great Thank talk. Uh, Emanuele uh, is Nazarene asking if where we can find your research, if it's shared somewhere. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, my um, uh, my research, uh, the the model that, that I presented is the work of uh, n not only for me but a group of researchers, uh, and, and it has developed uh, uh, since the last twenty years ago. And uh, in the presentation, I uh, it, it's a project that started from the uh, Department of Environmental Engineering in the University of Trento. And now is 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 developing by research center OIRAC in uh, in uh, in Bozen, so Tirol, Italy. And then there is a web page, which is uh, wjtop.org, with the uh, with the list of uh, of references. In particular, there is a, a scientific research published in two thousand six, uh, more or less uh, five or so six six years ago and now there is a work and we are working for a re-engineering of the code and we are going to publish a new paper in the next month I think. Uh, the package that I developed is uh, published on CRAN. It, uh, it, was, uh, it, it was part of, of my job and uh, he uh, it answered to uh, my request to work in R and uh, with uh, this model. So uh, in the in, in the website that, that I sit in the presentation, uh, you can have a link for any references. Okay. And uh, I can I can share the presentation uh, as soon uh, on, yeah, you, on my GitHub page. You can also write the links uh, in in the chat. Maybe it can be handy for for the attendees. Okay. Yep. Uh, I see that uh, uh, if somebody wants to ask live uh, some question, I can admit them in the session, actually, in the floor. I see Liston is waiting to get in or maybe not. Uh, I have a question myself for Emanuele. Uh, yeah. uh, in the <laughs> simulation, you, you need some input parameters and that you, you get an estimation. And uh, what about if uh, the you have some uncertainty in the estimate of the parameters? I mean, how do you evaluate the uncertainty of uh, your estimation? Okay, um, the background of this, uh, the uncertainty of, uh, in, in 
in this our the certainty of our estimation uh, should be uh, uh, there are uh, several plots to to, to do that the the certainty of our estimation is uh, uh, the model is a, a solver of this equation uh, you should uh, create different scenarios of, of input parameters and then uh, simulate uh, and, and simulate the process and and create a new output. The problem that is some uh, if you put the, if you work with a larger operation in, in, in operational way for larger for larger area, the the run of the model uh, elapses too long time. Uh, anyway, uh, it it depends on the it depends on the process because in in terms of of soil water process you can have a certainty in in, in the parameter est estimation. In in some operational project like a snow forecast, for instance, the uncertainty is uh, is is uh, the weather information because uh, the the weather is measured in in uh, in several points that are, are not altered, and there are a lot of of, of algorithm and. Uh, and uh, there is a research addressing that technology. I see. Thank you very much. Very clear. Okay. Thanks. So thank you again, Manuel. I, I I I I I will write the the link in the in the chat. If you like, it can be handy for for who oh, is no. attending. Of course. So let's move to to Stefano. Uh, I don't see. Uh, let me see check if there is any question in the chat. Otherwise, I, I do a question myself. Okay. Um, what I was wondering about uh, your presentation uh, was about this um, repeated hold out uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea that you had. Is that was about the extension. No, you 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 split in training and test many times. Uh, yeah. And uh, for each uh, uh, split, you, you get uh, like uh, the weights and uh, and the model estimate and everything. And I, I was think I was wondering how to, do you co combine the significance for the the slope parameter, for instance, from from these many splits? So uh, sorry, I didn't hear you well. Uh, how you how I combine the. If you do, I don't, maybe I, I lost something in your presentation. Mm -hmm. But uh, what uh, in the basic approach, you 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 you, you split the data, mm -hmm. and then you do the booster. But, but at the end, the output is like an intercept term and a slope with a significance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of the WQS. Right. But if you do this many times, you you will have many. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. For the slope. And I, my question is, how do you combine? Yeah, because so the, the, uh, we combine them just averaging them or uh, taking the median. So it's like uh, uh, when you do like uh, a bootstrap or something like that. So you repeat many times the uh, the, the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. No, that, 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 uh... Yeah, and I then, think that you can even, even prove uh, that if you take the median and you multiply the result by two, I think uh, you have you have the guarantee that that's a valid p-value. There, there is some research on that, how to mm -hmm. combine p-values from multiple splits. Okay. If you like, I can give you references. Okay, but, uh, thank you. Nice. Thank you. And uh, uh, I, I was also worried that you, you were using this uh, random forest like strategy you know, in the sampling columns not only rows yeah yeah Is exactly the idea yeah. comes from uh, random uh, random forest yeah exactly so in order exactly. to have a more uh, decorrelated data sets then you can subsamp uh, uh, yeah you can take uh, create subsets of variables and feed the model on the subsets and then you can average uh, the weights that you estimate for each subset and in this case, uh, it's important to take into account also uh, the uh, significance of the uh, beta one associated uh, to the uh, WKS index, uh, because um, uh, since we are creating different subsets, then maybe it can happen that uh, in some subsets, 
um, we don't have um, uh, we don't see an association between uh, the variables included in the subset and the outcome so when we average the weights then uh, we usually um, do a uh, weighted average of the weights uh, I see. To, to take so into account this also, uh, do you get also some uh, variable importance measure like in random forest from this process uh, yeah well the i think the the weights that we estimate the weight kind of uh, uh, yeah it can be interpreted as a, as a variable importance also yeah i see thank you stefano really oh, thank you nice uh, nice talk and let's move to the last speaker Aston. Uh, uh, sorry if i mispronounce your name you're pronouncing it very well but, uh, thank you uh so we, we have a, a question in the chat for you uh, let me get them oh your name is impossible yeah <laughs> <to tag. laughs> i'll change that after the session but i think i see the question here yeah okay. that's the first thing uh, uh yes uh, now the question for you would it would it be possible to use this model with the result of different new, new imaging methods eg fmri etc so different technologies yeah i think so so first current? of all i'm I'm a statistician, so I just, you know, learned about the, the brain imaging techniques by picking up from my colleagues. But I think in fMRI, you usually have this bold response, which shows how, how um, your, the activity in your brain, like the case, or goes as a function of time. And I think if the question is, for example, if you can meta-analyze the bold response from different studies, I think that definitely is possible because you still have a curve and the, the fundamental thing here is that you have some kind of curve uh, hopefully with uh, some reliability estimates like standard errors and you want to combine combine the curves to get a meta curve if you like and mm -hmm. i think that should be possible in fmri and eg i don't really know but i guess still if, if the method is um, estimates some kind of function as a function of some variable um, and you're able to predict from the function. Um, I believe that it should be possible, although it would require some work. So I would be very happy that I think I'll, I'll um, search a little bit for this and maybe we could make a chat with the one who asked the question a little bit later. So, yeah. Uh, uh, I see another question here in the chat from Andrew. Can you share the code? Uh, as, uh, as Stefan Oren said, this, sorry, this is not for you. Uh, so I have a question myself uh, for you. If uh, let me check if there is any other from the audience. Uh, I don't see them. Uh, some at some point you were also discussing how to. Uh, do a meta analysis of uh, the, the the different uh, uh, smooth terms, you know, that you mm -hmm. get from the the GAN. Yeah. But uh, how do you deal with the, the problem that uh, assessing the significance of a smooth term is not straightforward because you have the penalization involved. I mean, the p values are not really easy to deal with. Yes, definitely. Uh, have you thought about that? Yeah, because. That's, that's a very important point because what what's ha what happens if you just or, or the problem here compared to a GLM is that the estimation of the smoothing parameter is in another layer of uh, uncertainty in the model. And uh, Simon Wood and some others have developed a lot of methods and Simon Wood is the author of MGCV uh, that take this yeah. into account. Uh, so as of now, what we do is that we take for each of these um, models um, we just take the p-value from MDCV and then we use some old methods by Fisher et al. to combine p-values. Uh, oh, okay, I see. What I think we could do is that in, instead if we take a Bayesian view of the, um, of the GAMS, where you sort of mm -hmm. interpret the, the smooth terms can be also interpreted as random effects and you can sample so that you, you can get random samples. I think we could also get better, um, both better confidence intervals, uh, since we can in principle simulate from each of the models and then weigh those posterior samples in some way. Uh, and we're currently working on how to do that in the 
most appropriate way. No, very nice uh, taking an Asian approach. And uh, well, I had also a related question about confident bands mm -hmm. because uh, what the band showed basically, well, th probably they, they are not uh, uh, centered at uh, because you have uh, some uh, bias in the estimation due to the planization. Mm -hmm. So when, when you see the, the, the curve, uh, the estimate curve with the bands, it's not really centered around the expected value of the functions. So I, I was wondering whether. Uh, how how to, to 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 I mean if you had guarantees of coverage, mm -hmm. the usual guarantee of coverage as in the, the frequentist uh, uh, interpretation. Also here probably you can move to the Bayesian paradigm. Yeah, I think because because it's well understood for for a single uh, for a single gam, uh, it's well yeah. understood the properties both the frequentist and the Bayesian properties even with the smoothing parameter estimation. But uh, in this sort of first iteration of the metagam method, we, we just did it quite crudely. So I think there is, as you say, lots of ways, because you also have this problem that if one model is fitted on a very short range of the data and it's very confident, mm -hmm. uh, and you have another model fitted on a very much longer range of the data, you can get confidence bands that are very uh, natural, right? That they are very narrow in some ranges and then they get really wide in other ranges. So uh, we're working on methods to sort of take this let's say, the spatial correlation along the x-axis into account. I see. Yeah, 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 I see. Very nice. So I would like to thank uh, all the speakers again for a wonderful presentation and discussion about uh, uh, in the session. And uh, I think uh, uh, we are, our time is you. So I would like to thank uh, all people involved uh, and this is and this morning and uh, i would like to to thank the speakers and uh, say please enjoy the virtual lunch and uh, the rest of the conference uh, and uh, goodbye thank you very much for attending this session thank you thank you, thank you. goodbye bye. thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. bye, -bye.